Hi everyone, uh, welcome. It's fabulous to see many familiar faces here uh, and a few new ones. Um, we're really pleased to be having a conversation today about publishing programs on campuses. Uh, we have a fantastic lineup. Uh, as always, and so I, oh, I always forget to do my introductions. I'm Zoe from the Rebus community, uh, if we haven't met before. Uh, and so we host these monthly office hours uh, with OTN, our best buds in the OER space. Uh, and we like to use this time to explore challenges that people are facing, different questions that are coming up and some of the, the kinds of things that we're trying to develop together as we move forward uh, with creating OER and, and working with them in lots of exciting ways. Um, so I will now pass over to Karen from OTN to introduce our lineup today. Uh, I'll also mention thank you for um, those of you who come with the change in time. We usually do these a little earlier in the day, but we made accommodations today because we have a couple of very special guests from very, very far away from where we are here in Montreal um, and, and doing a lot of amazing work in Australia. So we're pleased to have those two with us. So thank you to everybody and especially the early risers uh, for, for being here at the, the different time. Okay, so over to you, Karen. All right, thanks, Zoe. And uh, as we say every time, we're delighted to be here and uh, co-host the office hours for you. My name is Karen, I'm with the OTN. Today we're going to talk about different experiences setting up publishing programs. Our guests have built publishing programs at their colleges, universities, or in statewide bodies. And they're gonna talk about uh, how they did it and what you can expect when you try to do the same. Our guests are going to speak about teams they've assembled, resources they've relied on or created, and hopefully share what they might do differently um, given what they've learned along the way. So I'm going to share our full lineup and then turn it over to them one by one. If this is your first office hours, um, everyone will speak for about five minutes and then we will ask you for your questions. So this is really a community driven conversation. Today, we welcome Adrian Stagg, who is manager and uh, of open educational practice office for the advancement of learning and teaching at the University of Southern Queensland. We also welcome Tawny Pierce, who's Associate Director of Content, Library Services at the University of Southern Queensland. We also have Amy Hoffer, Coordinator, Statewide Open Education Library Services at Open Oregon, and Christy Jensen, Program Development Lead, eLearning Support Initiative at University of Minnesota Libraries. So I'm going to now turn things over to Adrian and Tawny. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. I'm just going to share our PowerPoint slides. Can everyone see those? Yes. Excellent. Adrian's up first. So over to you, Adrian. Okay, thanks very much, Tawny. So before we uh, begin this morning, the first thing that I would like to do um, that we make sure that we acknowledge um, at the University of Southern Queensland is uh, to acknowledge that the University of Southern Queensland is situated on the country for which the traditional custodians, the Jarawar and Guyabal people have been custodians of that land for many centuries and upon which they have performed age old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal. We acknowledge their living culture and their unique role in the life of the region. And uh, I would like to offer my deep appreciation for their contribution to and support of our academic enterprise. Now, uh, for, the, for this morning's um, uh, presentation, we've decided to go with openness is everybody's business because you asked about teams that we have assembled and also the fact that if this is well beyond just one person's work in order to get this up and running and uh, as some of you might know uh, the picture in the background there is of uh, some migrating geese and uh, what what um, I've had to explain to colleagues before is that especially um, Canadian geese, for example, when they are migrating, they'll fly in that V pattern. But what will happen is periodically one bird will actually take the lead as that bird falls back and they all basically have a turn at leading and contributing to the health of the flock as they are moving on their journey. And I think that this is a really good metaphor for how we're approaching things at USQ that um, different people have stepped up at different points because we're all going on this journey together. 
Now, to give you a bit of background for USQ, we are actually quite different to a lot of universities in Australia. We are, in fact, one of the few regional universities uh, within a network. And uh, as such, we've got a very different student profile. So we'll take a look at who our students are, because essentially they're the ones who are driving a lot of our initiatives for OER. So if we move to the, the next slide, Tani. Um, so taking a look here, 80% of our students are online. So we, we will not see a vast majority of our students. 60% of them are first in family, and as such, they don't have an educational memory at home to draw from. So university is potentially a terrifying experience. And the transition to university is something that we spend a lot of resources in trying to um, get people acculturated and acclimated, uh, and acclimated to the university environment. 40% um, are from regional or rural remote environments. So with this comes uh, a whole range of reasons as to why they're at university. And in addition to that, a lot of things like internet connectivity, download speeds, and those sorts of things. We're talking about access. And 24% of our students are identified as being from a low socioeconomic status. So what I like to say that as a student focused strategy, openness makes sense if we're looking to improve access and reduce barriers to university education. And one of our primary uh, two focal areas this year, uh, one of which is open textbooks. So I'm gonna hand over to Tani now and uh, she can walk you through how we've assembled that team and the kinds of work that we're doing at the moment. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, just to give you an overview of how we work, um, we're, and we're very much, we're, we're at pains to say we're very much at the early stages of our journey into open access publishing, and we're learning a lot. Uh, so as Adrian said, open for us is everyone's business. And so we're part of an education portfolio, and we've tried to show it there in that slide but we're, we're lucky because um, we so Adrian and I are from different sections within that portfolio he's in the office for advancement for learning and teaching which includes quality and quality improvement ed developers educational designers grants um, and open educational practice I'm in the library but we've also got things like media design and development in our portfolio which is great um, our open access college which is that transition pathway for people People who may not go automatically into a university course so it's opening up their options and we've also got a digital life lab which is a research um, area that looks at digital literacy digital technologies and their impact on teaching and learning so we're really well situated and we've got a, a range of stakeholders that we're, we've tapped on the shoulder, I guess, and we're, we've assembled a team. We've, we've called it the OECD, sadly, a working group, which is the, um, <laughs> we're, we're aiming high, uh, Open Education Content Development Working Group. So there's reps from all over that section, and, and it's great. Um, they, they bring their own unique views, and what we found is uh, that, you know, we're working through our processes, but we're trying to slot people in within the educational portfolio so they can, you know, they, they know where they fit in that, in that scheme of things. Uh, we don't want our academics coming to us. We call it academic stuff. I think you call them faculty faculty. Um, so we don't want them coming to our portfolio and asking about open access publishing and getting a blank stare from someone. So that's where everyone's business comes from. So we, we've reused the University of Hawaii's, you know, pro process document here. But we did get feedback early on in the piece. And it's fantastic, the workflow, where we're not done <laughs> at the end. <laughs> so it's and so instead, we've revised this and we're looking at that continual flow. And this is what we're really focusing on at the moment, getting that support at each stage of this process, and making sure we have things like funding institutional strategy. Uh, so we're rewriting procedures at the moment and having input into our intellectual 
property policy, getting our um, platforms and IT, ICT structures in place, uh, getting our evidence gathering and reporting right, our recognition of our champions in this sphere, and also our community and communication right. So, you know, we want to tap into students' um, evaluation of our resources and, you know, uh, inclusion in the creation of resources. So that's our work in progress. <laughs> uh, so, and and to, to support that, we, we're doing things like creating resources. So we've got a, a style sheet for press books that's based on our internal um, style guides, things like that. We've also got a a pro forma for any book cover we produce, but so it's all fitting into that quality. And uh, but that's about that's about it from my perspective. I'll, I'll hand back over to Adrian. Right. Oh, so the the next question is then: What is just around the corner? for USQ and openness. And uh, hopefully our vision is somewhat clearer than the cats that you can see in the, uh, in the image there. Uh, although I'm sure that um, Tani wouldn't mind me saying that both of us have felt a little bit cross-eyed as we've been going through this process. Oh good, I'm getting a nod. Um, so as we look into the future, uh, as I mentioned beforehand, we've got two focus areas this year and they are open textbooks and also open assessment. Uh, we are hoping that within the next uh, few months, we're looking at an open textbook publishing kit, which will be basically our style guide. Uh, the templates that we have used, and also what we're doing is working on bringing in all of the uh, documentation that we have and putting that into a Pressbooks book so that we can share that and that other people can take that book and localize it as they need be. Now, it's worth mentioning as well at this point that it's well, um, that one of the other core areas, and I was reminded of this when Tani mentioned our Open Access College, is that we have a very large proportion of incarcerated students. So we have, I believe if memory serves, we actually service the largest number of incarcerated students in Australia. And so when you look at um, education as a very powerful mechanism to reduce recidivism and to also give people options when they, um, when they are released from custody, uh, we are we are finding that a lot of those students are enrolling in courses and then continuing with their enrollment um, post-release. And part of the, the focus on open textbooks is to target those courses as well, because um, we find that incarcerated students don't have access to an awful lot of money and purchasing a two, $300 textbook is often the major barrier for them being able to engage in something which is going to transform their life. So those are the main things um, that we have done to date. And I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring this in greater detail with you uh, as we move into the conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adrian and Tani. I would like to now pass it on to Amy. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Um, well, um, I'm Amy Hoffer. I'm with Open Oregon Educational Resources. And when I started um, thinking about what I would say about publishing um, here in Oregon, um, you know, in terms of what I do, um, I kind of think that I don't really have a publishing program, um, or at least I didn't set out to have one. What I do is I offer faculty grants to redesign their courses using OER. And those grants result in faculty creating stuff that needs to be shared so that other people don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and it can't be every single individual grantees problem to try to figure out how do I share, where do I share, right? Like I needed to be able to just provide that information to people. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of what comes out of the grants, um, some of it is, you know, a, a book that we're publishing, um, but some of it is a link to an open textbook that was adopted as is, or, um, 
you know, if it's a reading list of multiple sources, um, that reading list can be a document with an open license on it. Um, maybe it's a public facing um, version of a course in an LMS without any student data or content that lives in an institutional repository or even a citation to um, library database content. Um, because, you know, there are some disciplines where there just isn't open content available yet. So all of that is stuff that I can um, collect on the Open Oregon Resources page um, to let other instructors in Oregon know how did somebody solve the problem of teaching this course without assigning an expensive commercial textbook. Um, and, um, of course, sometimes there is a thing that somebody created to fill a gap. Um, and so in those cases, it's like, okay, how are we going to publish this? Um, you know, wh whatever definition or whatever low bar of publishing you want to say that we have. Um, so a couple of tools that I'm using, um, because they are easy to get started with and your data is really portable in case some other solution seems better later. Um, one is Pressbooks. Um, which I offer to grantees for their content. And what I tell them is, this is good if you have sort of book-like content. You know, it's linear, it has um, chapters, it has a table of contents. Um, and sometimes faculty are like, oh yeah, that totally fits what I want. And sometimes faculty are like, oh no, I wanna be very lateral. I prefer um, Google Sites or a folder of documents, or, you know, I wanna stay in the LMS or, um, whatever it is, um, and that's totally fine. Um, Pressbook, Pressbooks is one option that they have. Um, and the other um, tool that I've been having a lot of success with is um, OER Commons. Open Oregon Educational Resources has a group, um, which is like the free way to make um, an institutional presence in OER Commons. and um, creating an OER Commons group has let me have a proof of concept of using that as our repository. There's sort of like a perennial question of whether we need a statewide repository or a regional repository. Um, and I always feel like the answer is no, we don't need 50 repositories, one per state in the US. Let's contribute to where other content already is. Um, so OER Commons um, has been good as a proof of concept of that idea, um, but also it's just very, very easy to um, use it as a referatory. So for example, we just did a course redesign sprint during Open Ed Week, um, and the result was like 30 or 35 openly licensed syllabi and reading lists, and I made a folder in our group in OER Commons. Um, so um, I just want to say something I've been thinking about is that because um, the grants are for course redesign and all of the publications that come out of those um, grants, um, you know, are for these individual course redesigns, um, the textbooks, for example, that you find in Pressbooks um, are really individually tailored to how one instructor approaches the um, learning objectives for the courses. And um, so they might look the same as, you know, for example, what um, UMN creates, and we'll hear from Christy in a minute, you know, they do those beautiful jobs and make, um, you know, a real version of record of a textbook that's widely applicable um, to courses. And um, a lot of what comes out of the grants can be like very, a very individual approach to the content. Um, and of course, the beauty of the open license is that people can, um, you know, revise and remix and take what works for them and not take what doesn't work. But I think that there can be um, some confusion when they're both a press book, but one is, you know, a version of record that's gone through a peer review process, et cetera, and the other is, um, you know, this is a very individual product of a grant. So that's something that I've been thinking about regarding um, the publishing program. Um, and I just will wrap up by saying that my biggest challenge is that I'm completely at capacity in terms of um, managing the projects. And so right now I'm advocating for funding 
for an open education publishing librarian position to better manage the resources that are created by Oregon's faculty grantees um, to really make it a publishing program where I wouldn't say, you know, be invited to a talk like this and say like, but I don't think we really have a publishing program, you know, where I wouldn't have those caveats where somebody is really treating it as a collection that's discoverable and accessible and, you know, really widely reusable, um, you know, sort of less ad hoc, because I feel like I've sort of backed into um, publishing as a component of grant project management rather than um, as a standalone project. So uh, looking forward to the discussion. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Um, the discussion is already happening in the chat. And so um, after we hear from Christy, we will start um, looking and addressing those questions. So now I'd like to turn things over to Christy. Thank you, everybody. Um, so I had jotted down some ideas of what to talk about. And then I hear other people talk and I'm like, well, maybe I should talk about this. But um, <laughs> um, I have been doing this work for, I don't know, um, since the end of 2012. And um, so our program, I would not say is actually, it's not actually a OER publishing program. It's a, an affordable content program with an, with an OER publishing element. So that's one prong of what we do here at the University of Minnesota. And um, the team is mostly composed of myself and Shane Nakarud, who I think many of you are probably familiar with as well, who's great. Um, and he wasn't able to be here to be today due to another commitment. But um, so we do something similar to what Amy was talking about. We do offer um, some incentive grants for faculty on campus. And some of those incentive grants, which are, they're not huge, they end up um, resulting in published open textbooks. We're a little bit odd in that the libraries also, at the same time that our initiative started, there was also the beginnings of a library publishing initiative. And so we do have a library publishing group. Their focus is more on scholarly outputs and other types of outputs, but we work together with them. And they sometimes provide funding in addition to our grant funding for things like maybe for our um, more robust textbooks, maybe um, a, a copy editor who will go through and copy edit the work. So like the incentive funding, the faculty get to use that for other things. Um, and then we coordinate with our, um, our publishing group and they do a lot of management of some of the administrative types of things like maybe um, an MOU that the faculty member signs just to make sure that we understand that we are going to continue to host this thing even if they leave the university or if something changes, um, things like that. So, so that frees things up. Um, that admin piece is something that can take up some time developing and also administrating. Um, so I, I also, so the, some of the questions that came to mind when we're listening to the other folks talk is, I like to think that one of the things that we're doing with our publishing program is rethinking what a textbook actually is. So maybe for an aerospace engineering faculty member, it is just pages and pages of formulas and examples of formulas, and it's not a traditional textbook. Um, I, I, you know, maybe it is a bunch of open OER chapters from different books for like an ag communication class that gets published in our reserve system and it never gets published as like a full fledged press books open textbook. Um, and then there are the really beautiful things. So um, there were some open textbooks that were heavily used that were going away and the University of Minnesota republished those and did some cleanup but with some issues with those. I won't mention where they came from. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, those are, their press books makes things look really beautiful. And so we've had, we had an opportunity with those to kind of think about what makes things look nice. And then when we began working with different faculty members, um, you know, I worked with a faculty member on a, a design equity textbook, which I think is really lovely. It's not super long, but it, it touches on really pertinent concepts uh, for society today, and it contributes to education in general and talking about really difficult topics, I think. Um, so when I think about publishing, I think about like, where are the niche things that aren't going to get represented 
ever, you know, in major publishing. So like maybe the design equity book wouldn't have gotten published by a major publisher, but at this, it's a really great candidate. We also have a geography textbook that I think could have been a mainstream published item, but the faculty member is generous in wanting to, you know, provide access to it. So pushing the boundaries of what do we think textbooks are, I think is a, is a great thing that we can do as part of our, our programming. Um, I should have looked at what the time was when I started. Um, we started with a local install of Pressbooks and we moved to a hosted version, which has been, I think, really good for us um, via our collaborative partnership as part of Unison. I think I, I agree with Amy, like publishing, I, 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 whenever I go and talk to other institutions, like I talk about our grants and a lot of people don't have money for grants. I think you can do a call for proposals. You don't have to have money. If you're willing to provide some support and some teams to help faculty, I think you can do a call for proposals and you never have to offer money. I think that's another option. Um, the other thing that I had down is I think the devil is often in the details. So it's like, you'll get started working on a book and it's like, oh, we should have made a decision about what level of headers we were going to put throughout this. And you know, then you have to go back and change. So like once you've done a project, you learn like some of those details, like how are we going to work with cited resources and additional resources at the end and footnotes and, um, you know, so it's like there's a lot of different little details that go into the styling and the formatting and, and pull out quotes and different things like that. So if you can, if you can establish that with the faculty member that you're working on, that can be really great. And so the other flexibility factor is I think many places to publish, like Amy was saying, OER Commons, it could be in library uh, reserves, it could be in press books. Um, but I think the other flexibility is also, um, oh, what was I going to say? <laughs> um, I lost that thought, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm sure it'll come back to me. Um, it's thinking about accessibility up front, making sure that faculty understand expectations with regards to putting in alt tags and really good descriptions of images. Um, oh, the other flexibility piece is do we turn, so we do have access to press books. Do we do all of the work or do we turn uh, things over to faculty and let them work in press books themselves? That's another detail um, that can get worked out. And then finally, the other thing is we have both kind of informal and formal publications. So we have things that get branded with our University of Minnesota Libraries Publishing, but we have things that are just really kind of more study guides, but they're really beautiful study guides. And so those things are worthwhile in pursuing, but maybe they don't ever get published as a full open textbook, but they're still really valuable content. Um, like Amy said, capacity is always an issue. This is one strand of what we do. It is not everything that we do. And these things can be really time consuming. Um, so I think that might be my five minutes. <laughs> and that was really rambling, <laughs> sorry, but it was kind of trying to connect into what other people had said. Wait, Christy, can I ask a question? Actually, Anita asked it in the chat about the informal content. Does that get shared? Um, you know, so it's like some of it is still under development and, but yes, our goal would be to definitely, yeah, I mean, our goal is always to openly license everything and to share things as widely as possible. But some of those informal things, it's like harder to nail down a completion date. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I felt very rambly. It was great. Thank you, Christy. As you said, there are lots of details. And so when we're sharing details, it always feels like we're going on, but that's how it is. So um, there were a lot of questions that started in the chat. I think the first one is from Olga. Olga asked, can you provide more details about the grants? Who is responsible for the grants? Are they sustainable amounts? I think this is for Adrian and Tani. And I will let Adrian um, answer that because that's what he looks after. So, Adrian. Okay, so in about 2015, we started off uh, an open grants program at USQ. Now, uh, we do have funding towards that. And the funding, of course, as we would all know, is variable um, due to university budgets being quite variable. Um, and so what we do is each year we work out the, the focus areas that we want to um, encourage people to 
put in a proposal for. It is a competitive process. So this year, for example, we only have, uh, we have four grants which are available and they're in the categories of open textbooks and open assessment. Uh, we do give priority and we, we state all of this up front, the priority is given to first year courses, to courses with very high enrolments, or to proposals that target more than one discipline. And uh, the participants are actually given an 18 month period to complete, which also includes evaluation and we highly encourage them to publish and present as part of this. Um, the one thing that I will mention that has, uh, that, that I find that people uh, are interested in is the actual structure of what happens after you get the money. Because in a lot of grants, I don't, I don't know how it is in other countries, but in Australia, if you get a learning and teaching grant, it's often, here's the money, go and make good things happen. And we'll see you at the end when you put your final report in. We decided that because these are very much about building capacity and building capability, um, that once a month, all of the participants come together for an hour and a half. And we start things off with just very simply with tea and coffee, sit down and just, you know, de-stress. And we get people over the last four years who have said that 20 minutes at the beginning where we just sit down, have a cuppa, have some biscuits, um, is the best start to any meeting, anytime, anywhere, um, where they just get to take a load off. And then we, we go around the table and we talk about what, what are the successes? What do they want to celebrate this month? And then what do they need help with in the coming month? And then also the last part of that is, is building their domain knowledge. So they might say, well, we're all in a position now where we want to know more about Creative Commons licensing. And so we'll invite someone into the community. Uh, we bribe them with coffee and biscuits and they come into the community and share their knowledge. And then the process just repeats each month. So that, that community building aspect um, has been something that's been very successful as well as the funded grants. Um, I want to chime in because um, what you um, described is different from how um, I, I do payment, which is at the end, um, but I do try to have a midpoint payment also, um, hopefully at about the point that people are getting really discouraged and maybe like calling me crying because um, <laughs> people do hit a wall on these projects. Um, but I find it really interesting that you pre pay for the projects um, because I'm, uh, I feel like I need to sort of have half the money in reserve in order to get people's enrollment data and also the thing that we will share, whether that's the link to the open content that they adopted or, you know, the final draft of um, the press book or whatever it is. But what I tell people, um, you know, as they start to panic about needing to get done, um, you know, I'll tell people like, you know, think of it as a pilot. Of course, you're never really done. Everyone always continues to tweak their course. Just because the grant period is done doesn't mean that you can't keep working on the project in an organic way. And uh, with that funding as well, um, we, we asked them to put in a budget, uh, an indicative budget as part of the proposal. So for example, last year, um, both groups uh, put in their indicative budget to have the equivalent of a project manager. So it was just somebody who arranges all the meetings, keeps everybody on track, and for the open textbook project that we funded last year, they had somebody who could take the, the bulk of the work of putting everything into press books and being able to develop those sorts of things. So they, they do find that the money often allows them to buy other people's time. Uh, and that's where I find that the benefit exists. So our grants are actually more incentive grants than payment for the product. And so our grants are executed, they get the money pretty much right away. And, and that's for any project, not just the OER projects, but our maximum is 1500. So if they're writing a full open textbook, it's really not that much money. And, and they don't have to use it towards the project, but a lot of people do. So like one we have a really good uh, book that will be out eventually that um, is from a very 
popular class. It's the biology of sex, essentially. Um, and it's a really popular class. And um, they hired a graphic design student to kind of like tie the graphic design throughout their whole book. And, and, and actually they applied for the grant a couple of times in order to keep her on because it's a larger project. Um, and we do a lot of the project management. So part of the other thing that they get is kind of the team that's wrapped around them in order to, which is sometimes what people are looking for more than the money. Um, and so the team can vary like, and the involvement can vary. Maybe it's just a check in once every six months, or maybe it's somebody who's actually kind of project managing and bringing things together. So our grants are a little bit different. And we've maybe had one bad actor <laughs> in our history of grant providing. Um, and you know, it's hard to get any money back, but, um, but I think out of the number of grants that we've given, that's pretty good. You know, and you go back and you think, well, do we give it after the fact? But it's hard to get people involved. You know, if you're, if you're waiting, some of, and some of our projects have taken much longer than 18 months to complete too. Um, that's the other thing that flexibility thing is that takes a lot of nudging at different points in time because people have competing priorities. And um, I received a, a related question in the chat um, for any of you or all of you. Our main constraint is faculty time. Money is great, but do they create ways to purchase course releases or other time creation? Um, course releases cost more than what my grant project pay scale is. And I've heard similar feedback, um, you know, can we have a course release? Um, and yeah, I just, it's, it's, I was talking with someone this morning about, um, you know, how you want to balance like really paying people for their valuable time and incentivizing this work that has such an important return for students. And you wanna balance that against being able to include more people in the program, right? So how to thread that needle. With our grants, I, I would echo the same as, as Amy is that one, the amount of money doesn't get a lot of buyout. But the other thing is that we've, um, we've very deliberately positioned our grants so that they ask people to identify a challenge that currently exists in a course that they are teaching. And part of the grant is to implement their proposed solution uh, as a part of their regular teaching and to engage with students um, and to also get student feedback. And so the rationale then is that providing money from buyout actually removes you from the space that you need to be in in order to meet the goals of the grant. So this is kind of a side note. I put a couple things into the chat, but um, so one faculty member brought content that design equity book had content that came from when the faculty member was actually on sabbatical that her department paid for, right? Um, but then the other thing that has come up for her is, I mean, she's a full professor, so she's tenured, she's achieved the highest rank that she can achieve, but she still has to, you know, produce output that counts on her CV on a regular basis. And so like she's been looking for ways to how can we um, nominate the book for an award because that will give it more cred on her CV. How can we do some post production review process um, and uh, what was the other thing we were going to oh we also added I don't know that we'll get any feedback but we added like a request for adoption information from anybody who uses the book because adoption information might give more credibility in her review process um, as well. And then she and I are working on different speaking engagements and writing engagements about the process um, as well. So actually some of those supplementary things might give her more credit as a professor than the book itself actually did, even though she had a sabbatical that supported the creation of that material. 
I, yeah, I love those uh, more creative ideas to think about the ways that you can be be creating that value too. Um, and I will a little bit queue up for uh, for a couple of future sessions where we're going to be digging into these questions a bit more as well. So we're looking forward to those. Give a few more details at the end of the call. Uh, before she took off, a Priva actually dropped a question in, and I might call on Tani to, to answer this one if you can. Um, looking at that diagram you had of all the different teams, I was wondering if you could speak to how either easy or challenging it has been to have them all in coordination with each other. Uh, and maybe, you know, was the, the seed of the idea founded with one and then others were brought on, or how did that collaboration come together? Uh, challenging is the word, I think, and Adrian would probably <laughs> agree with that uh, because it, it is quite a big portfolio. Um, but it, so basically, um, I, I think Adrian and I have always worked quite closely together for years. Um, I have a copyright background, so that has come in handy. Um, but this has actually come, um, I'm on the executive team of the ed portfolio and it came from a group discussion of our executive team where we want uh, like a, a an understood approach um, across the portfolio um, and and different teams to work together because we've got amazing skills like you know media development and design educational designers we know not one person can give the full full suite of um, support. So uh, where we're struggling with this approach is we have a working group, but it's a capacity issue again. We really need one central person to be our open contact for publishing. At the moment, it's kind of shared between Adrian and I and our liaison librarians sometimes field those queries, but I guess we've got that lovely um, uh, communication and, and we've got lines of communication set up in that group but we still need that uh, key contact uh, within you know across the University of Southern Queensland where if people want to publish they know who to come to so and we need to tell our staff that too so that's where so we're actually trying to get an open access librarian at the moment um, to work in league with Adrian and I and actually oversee the duties of this group so does that does that kind of answer what she was yeah. looking at? Absolutely, yep. and and obviously a clear connection to what Amy is identifying in her context as well, and and the challenges there. And I, it's it's exciting to hear people talking about this. Is this is you know a lot of people have been doing this work in lots of ways, and that they're identifying this gap in skills that can be you know filled by. Um, frankly, some very lucky people uh, who'll be working yes. with all of you one day. <laughs> and there's, and I mean, people, people, <laughs> people have made mention of project management. I think that's key for that role to be a, a project manager and editor. We were lucky enough to get some funding just for December last year, where we did get through one textbook. It was just an adaptation of a text uh, that's up on our press book site. But you know, she was a jack of all trades. She's an editor, a librarian a project manager. So that's my, <laughs> you know, that's what we want in that kind of role. Right, that's a bit the job description. We've found the same thing. So we've had hands on with, I think, around 30, maybe a little over, over the last couple of years. And that is something we've seen too, it being the, often the critical determination of, of success or, you know, I won't say the opposite of success, but things taking longer and being more complicated and, and more kind of confusing. So that that kind of key point of, of contact, as you say, uh, and there's sort of a measure of responsibility that comes with that at the project level as well. Um, just of, of making sure you have that, that person who has the knowledge and, and is their responsibility, their prime responsibility is keeping things moving. Okay, thank you. Did um, Christy or Amy, did you want to jump in on the question of teams and whether you've kind of had similar experiences to what Tani was discussing or uh, as you've established things? Um, Open Oregon Educational Resources is me and I did get to hire an assistant this year and then there's also Wendell, my cat. Um, who assists me by lying on the couch in the office. Um, but hearing you describe all the different roles um, on your campus, um, it just sounds fabulous. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I can only hope someday. And I think part of it is being in that statewide role. Um, I'm not at a campus 
with an existing department where it's sort of natural to pull people's talents from. Um, so it's, um, yeah, it's really been like, you know, here, let's hire a statewide coordinator. Let's give her funding to offer grants. And I'm like, and <laughs> this other stuff has followed on from there. <laughs> yeah, we don't have extensive teams. Like, so the copy editor that we use, it's an external person that's funded who is awesome. But, um, uh, and I worked with her when Shane and I worked on our book, you, you know, together um, that went through libraries publishing. But our, the team is usually me and or Shane, and then like if if there's other people from the department that get involved, um, yeah, it's kind of piecemeal for the most part for us at this part at this point. And I do, I do have to. Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> oh, and, uh, uh, here you go. <laughs> here you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, somebody asked about um, like how much grantees do themselves. And so it means that, um, you know, the more projects I am managing, the more hands off I am and the more grantees are doing the work or the support on their own campus at their college or university. And I was just going to say that um, we are very much, you know, this is this is just something added on to our current role too. So it's not it's not perfect here by any means. And we're doing it in addition to so there's been very, you know, last year when we were pushing that book through, there were many long hours, you know, <laughs> above and beyond just to get that through in time. So yeah, rest assured we're in the same boat. <laughs> we're just trying to tap into those teams a bit more effectively. Well, and it's not actually an add-on, like this is my job. So it's like, I'm lucky enough to like not have that added on. It's just one piece of my job. But, but these projects can be very time consuming as I know most of you know. Thank you for that, Amy. I did get a, a picture of, of the cat. It's very, very important to do so. <laughs> and I think I'll, I'll mention as well, I've at least in the experiences I've had with projects is that it seems to be quite campus dependent how much these teams are able to come together and willing to come together you know I've heard stories of say you know libraries and centers for teaching and learning being really tight-knit and on the same track and I've heard other stories where those same two players can be quite um have quite different goals and, and different kind of opinions on on where OER should go on the campus um, so I think it's it's interesting to see all these different models that can be successful in those different contexts because it may be that some people are facing uh, you know a really welcoming group and they'll be able to put together the sort of extensive network um, that, that you have Tani and then there'll be others where, where that isn't the same possibility but there's still a lot you can work with and, and do within that context which is great to see. You're, yeah. you're a one woman powerhouse Amy. <laughs> I mean, I've also, what I was going to say is I've also been surprised by sort of the needs in terms of time and like how in-depth the projects go. Like you can have someone um, adopt a textbook as is, which seems to be the most straightforward type of project. Um, and you realize actually that the way that they've approached their course redesign, they've taken like a really hugely deep dive that makes it a very involved project that you weren't expecting, um, you know, or, you know, the categories just become very slippery. Like I had a project where somebody decided to um, update and revise. Um, this is the Excel, um, the Excel book that um, came out of Portland Community College, which um, I love what they ended up with, but um, because they were revising um, somebody else's work, um, at some point, you know, they called me and they were like, this would be so much less work if we had just started from scratch. You know, even though the, it, it's sort of lower on the pay scale, if you will. Um, so I have, I have wound up being surprised by the ways that the categories sometimes are not what I expect them to be. We um, adapted a, uh, a research textbook last year and we tried to Australianize the content and we didn't think that would take that long, but it did. <laughs> so it was just, that was an interesting process too. I haven't, oh, sorry, go ahead, Christy. 
I was just going to say the tenant that everything takes longer than you think it will is especially applicable in this space. <laughs> expecting the unexpected, expecting to be surprised. Um, I received another question in the chat, and that is, um, what is the process to get the purse holders and other administrators to start buying in and supporting OER publishing? I think I, we hear return on investment a lot. <laughs> Adrian will agree. <laughs> and Adrian, do you want to speak about what you're getting together for our, for our institution? So one of the things, um, given our mission and also the fact that we, we have a, a very current uh, st um, strategic action plan for social justice at our university, uh, part of my work over the last couple of weeks has been pulling together all of our core courses. So these are courses for um, each degree or each program where students don't have a choice about taking them, the mandatory courses, and noting down all of the textbooks and textbook prices. And then what I'm doing is getting all the 2018 student load data and simply saying that, okay, so by course, so we, um, I mean, the, the, the figures don't take very much to add up where you actually can say to a faculty, an individual student taking the mandatory courses is expected to purchase this amount in textbooks and as and as a cohort this is how much we have asked them to spend on textbooks and uh, when you start to look at just those first year courses and uh, and make the argument that these are actually resources that aren't covered by student loans um, and and the like these are out-of-pocket expenses for students that's where we're starting to gain a little bit of traction uh, the other thing that we're putting against this data is the rising data on our institutional student loans because we offer um, uh, loans for educational resources and a lot of our students use them for textbooks so we as of last year we're now identifying those loans by discipline and so we're we're hope well what will hopefully happen is we'll be able to say well here's how much you're asking students to spend on textbooks here's the percentage of your students who are asking for loans um, surely this speaks to the fact that we have a problem So, I mean, I think we've all heard in many different places that, you know, you can tailor your message to whatever audience, what's going to appeal to the audience that you're going to ta be talking to. And sometimes it's cost savings for students and retention and graduation rates. Um, but one of the things that we were, that really got us started was um, there was a, a few years ago, our, we had a new provost and she was focused on transforming teaching and learning. And so we, snuck the content piece into that and um and then that allowed us to collaborate with other people who provide central services who might have more direct faculty more direct contact with faculty when they're thinking about course redesign like a, what used to be our center for teaching and learning and is now the center for educational innovation our academic technology support services folks so those folks will often be key players in bringing people bringing us to people's attention or pointing people in my direction for getting that work done. So I think that's the messaging, but it's also maybe the collaborative partners that you can connect with who can make a difference. Yeah, I think that, um, as Christy said, the audience um, matters a lot, right? Like, is it is it about improving teaching and learning? Like, is that what your audience is gonna respond to? Or is it about the um, student savings and student need, as Adrian was mentioning? Um, and, and it's really a matter of um, just being prepared <laughs> um, w in terms of who you're talking to. So um, it's the end of our biennium in Oregon and um, the legislature is in session and working on the budget for the next biennium. So yesterday I went to Salem for two minutes <laughs> and gave testimony about why we should continue to fund um, open ed in Oregon, but of course I always say textbook affordability and open education, right, because 
um, it's a bunch of legislatures. If you say OER, that's jargon. And um, they really want to know about student savings. They want to know how many students have been served by the program and how much money they've saved as a result of the statewide spending. Um, and we know as educators that that is not the be all and end all, but it's a very concise talking point. Super, thank you all. I think we're at the conclusion of our hour together with a mere three minutes remaining. This has been yet another robust conversation. So I'd like to thank everyone who offered their questions and additional resources in the chat and during the call. And I would like to ask all of you to join me and Zoe in thanking our guests, Christy, Amy, Tawny, and Adrian. Uh, thank you all for sharing your experiences with us. Um, it's always great to get together and see everyone on a monthly basis. And I wish you all well until we meet again next month. Zoe, would you like to talk about next month's call? Yes, I can do. Thanks, Karen. Uh, so as I sort of alluded to, this conversation has set us up really nicely for what's coming. Uh, we're trying something a little bit new and we are doing a two-parter for our next two calls. So the April and May uh, calls will be connected in theme, and we're going to be looking at invisible labor in OER. So that's a very big topic. Next month, what we're going to be do, doing is thinking about what that means, sharing stories about people's experiences with that. And then with the follow-up session, the second one will be more focused on strategies and, and things like you know, author compensation that we touched on here today and really getting into some practical ways to, to consider that. We're really excited about these. Uh, so the date for the first session will be on April 25th and we'll be back at our 2 p.m. Eastern time. All of those details will, of course, go out through those usual channels, through Twitter and the newsletter. And we're really, really excited to see you all there. And I'll add my thanks to Karen uh, for everybody here today, our wonderful speakers. It was really, really fantastic to hear from you all. We have so many ideas brewing here um, that we're really excited to, to be able to share in this context and, and build on together. It's really wonderful that uh, we, we get to have these calls every month. Um, thoroughly enjoy them. So thank you all so much. We'll see you all next time.